Good evening. Welcome to worship tonight. Our Monday Thursday worship um, on during Holy Week is also a very special service for two young women today who will be sharing in their first communion. Natalie and Peyton will be taking first communion. They had their first communion festival on Saturday where they learned about how communion started long, long ago in Egypt when the, the Israelites were getting ready to be set free from slavery. So we'll be sharing that tonight and also um, want to let you know that tomorrow is Good Friday. We have a service here at 1 o'clock that will be on Facebook Live and also on YouTube, um, probably about 2.15, 2.30. It'll get posted there. Easter, 8.30 and 10.30 in the morning. The 10.30 service will be on Facebook Live with the YouTube being posted after that. I would like to today just say a shout out and a thank you to our office staff this week in particular. This is an intense week for all of us and we decided at the beginning of the week we were just going to be present to each other and do our best work and um, I think we've just about made it. There is one more day yet but I think we're going to make it all the way through the week together. I'd also like to thank those in the sound booth. They have a lot of extra work this week and Dave and the choir for the extra time they're putting in. Uh, we're just so grateful for everyone pitching in and helping as we move into um, Good Friday and then Easter Sunday. I'd like to ask you all now to stand as we just quietly calm ourselves down and have a few moments of silence as we prepare for worship. We are so grateful, Lord, that you welcome us into this time of worship and sharing in your body and blood together. Thank you for Peyton and Natalie and this step in their faith life. Thank you for their families who have come to celebrate this time with them. We pray that each one of us will have quiet hearts and quiet minds as we sing and listen and experience the presence of your Holy Spirit among us, helping us to understand, to um, ask for forgiveness, and to move into a new place as we head into Good Friday tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends in Christ, in this Lenten season we have heard our Lord's call to struggle against sin, death, and the devil all that keeps us from loving God and from loving each other. This is the struggle to which we were called when we were baptized. Within the community of the church, God never wearies of forgiving our sin and giving the peace of reconciliation. On this night, let us confess our sin against God and against our neighbor and enter the celebration of the great three days reconciled with God and with one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. Hear God's words of forgiveness for you. 
God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing together, Jesus, the very thought of you. Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. you. Let's pray. Holy God, source of all love, on the night of his betrayal, Jesus gave us a new commandment to love one another as he loves us. Write this commandment in our hearts and give us the will to serve others as he was the servant of all your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The first lesson is taken from Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month, they are to take a lamb from each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. 
Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. Gospel from John, the 13th chapter, beginning with the first verse. Glory, Glory to, you, to you, O Lord. Lord. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you'll understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean, and you are clean though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should, also, you should also do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. 
if God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I'm with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. The sermon I'm about to share with you tonight reminds me of the Monday Thursday right after the pandemic started. We had no idea at that time what would happen next. It was April 9th. We were early into it. At that time, we weren't even sure if we were going to live to tell about it. We'd switched over to online worship on March 22nd, so the sanctuary was empty except for five or six of us who produced the service each week. There was a certain sadness in that for many reasons. Most of all because it was empty without you and the human contact we missed. We're accustomed to it. We knew we were in the midst of a drastic change, but we literally had no clue, did we? How could we prepare what was coming next? especially since we had no no clue what might be coming next. And here we are, two years later, on Monday, Thursday. We're together again, and we're remembering again our own history. But more importantly, we remember what happened for Jesus and his disciples on the Thursday night right before the Jewish Passover day in Jerusalem. The disciples at that time were just as clueless about what was coming next as we were about COVID two years ago. But Jesus knew exactly what was happening and what was coming. Within just a few hours, the disciples' world would begin to fall apart. In fact, the moments of this meal mark the end of their life together as they've known it for the last three years. So tonight we're going to talk about endings and beginnings because that's what's happening in the Exodus scripture that Sue read about how they were to prepare for the Passover in Egypt. And that's what's happening also in the gospel I just read. Something old and familiar is giving away, giving way to something new and unknown. And the new, the new can't happen if the old doesn't pass away. But it's still going to be gut-wrenching, whatever happens next. In the Exodus scripture, 400 years of slavery are ending for the Israelites. Suffering and oppression and whippings and impossible demands, plus the time there was the edict from the Pharaoh that had taken the lives of all the baby boys. The Israeli slaves will be freed from this horror, and it's wonderful, except for this to happen, they're going to have to leave everything familiar, all the old ways of doing things, their homes and their belongings, their schedules, their neighbors. They'll have to listen to a new leader, Moses, who speaks for the Almighty God of the Hebrew people. They'll have to follow directions, and and metaphorically, they're going to have to step over the edge of a cliff into something entirely new, into the unexpected, the unpredictable, and sometimes it'll feel very much like the unreasonable. So in Exodus, God instructs the people through Moses how to end well and how to begin the new life together well. God institutes the Passover, giving them careful instructions. Did you hear how detailed those instructions were? Detailed and careful instructions to preserve their lives while they're making a ritual of the experience at the same time. Rituals help us remember. 
And that scripture from Exodus was probably included in later ritual readings, just like we read it tonight. If you were listening, you heard that they were to kill a one-year-old male perfect lamb, roast it, not boil it, and then they were to take the blood from the lamb, and we learned about this in First Communion Festival, remember, girls? They would take that blood and put it on the door posts and on the lintel of their door of their house so that when death came through that whole area that night, it would not enter their home. God gave them a very prescribed way to prepare and eat the lamb and told them to be ready with packed clothing and belongings so they can move quickly into whatever is coming next. Of course, they don't know what that is. But they do know it's the end of slavery and the beginning of a new life, a life only God can give them. They will remember it from generation to generation to generation every single year they will celebrate their deliverance one generation after another after another observant jews still observe passover thousands of years later they say we were delivered it's personal they enter the experience they say the deliverance is ours and it's relived in gratitude to God. In fact, Jesus and his disciples, so, so, so many years later after the deliverance from Egypt, Jesus and his disciples are observant Jews. And in the Gospel of John, they're observing this meal together the night before Passover. This night, Jesus signals to them that something is really changing. During the meal, he tears the bread apart, as is his custom, but he says something entirely new. Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Whenever you do this, remember me. And the traditional cup of wine after the meal is now a New covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of this cup, remember me. Whenever you eat the bread and drink the wine, you proclaim my death until I come again. Jesus, the word of God, is changing the words. Now, this ritual hadn't changed since that night of liberation in Egypt, but now it has. This is a new beginning. The Passover is now about Jesus. Remember me, Jesus says. Jesus, who is the liberator of all people, not just slaves in Egypt, but all people, on the cross, he will free all from bondage to sin and bondage to death. If we could see the whole arc of biblical history, we would know that Passover had always been pointing toward Jesus. But within the next 24 hours of Jesus' life, it's pointing to Jesus in a whole new way for now Jesus is the perfect Lamb of God. And he will replace the Passover Lamb. The Lamb of God will shed his blood on a cross. It will be poured out for all people for the forgiveness of sins. His flesh will be torn as the bread was torn, only worse. His flesh will die. His remains will be buried in a tomb. If you'd been in Jesus' place, how would you have prepared your disciples for something like this?
Well, here's the wonder of Jesus. He narrows everything down to two things that are absolutely necessary and essential. When he's washing their feet, he says, serve each other and let others serve you. Love each other and let others love you. First, he serves them as only slaves would serve their masters by washing their feet. Rabbis didn't do this. This offends Peter at first, astounds the others, but they all begin to absorb the lesson. If you're going to meet, be like me, Jesus says, you're going to have to take care of each other, no matter what. No pulling rank, no claiming to have authority so you can put other people down, no saying that's not in my job description, or I didn't sign up for this, I'm not doing it. Nope. If you're going to survive what comes next, you're going to have to take care of one another, see what the other person needs, and care for them in the humble ways I've cared for you. Secondly, love each other as I've loved you. Wow. Put up with quirks and annoying habits in others. You know, you all have them. I have them too. We all do. Listen before presenting your own point. That takes a lot of self-control. Give each other grace. Look for the story under the story. Care about another's feelings and stressors. Be patient. No one's going to get it right all the time. Forgive each other. That's where love shines. Love makes forgiveness possible. And remember to call each other back to the love I have for you. Remember me, Jesus said. Remember me. Share in my body and blood. Remember I've given them for you because I love you. It's the way I can be present with you in a physical way, even after I'm no longer with you. It's a way you receive my forgiveness and my love. Love each other selflessly in that way. Jesus calls his disciples to the love that only Jesus can give them right before their world falls apart right before they watch him die on the cross, right before they lose hope, right before he's buried in the tomb owned by a rich man named Joseph. These are his last words. I trust they ring in their ears. My dear children, serve each other and let others serve you. Love each other and let others love you. Those are Jesus' words to us, too, over 2,000 years later. Love each other, serve each other with all your hearts. Amen. Please stand as we sing together where charity and love prevail.
In these holiest of days, we offer prayer for ourselves, our neighbors, and our world. We pray for the church around the world. Write your new commandment of love and service on the heart of every believer and strengthen pastors, priests, deacons, and lay leaders in humble service for your people. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for the good earth you have made. Inspire us to care for it with wisdom and forward thinking so that all living things can thrive. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for leaders in every land. Kindle compassion and equity in all who are called to administer justice. Guide all in positions of power away from the temptations to abuse. Guide them to work toward the common good. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for all who are in need, especially those who are incarcerated or unjustly accused. Illuminate paths to end oppression and form supportive communities gathered around a common commitment to justice and peace. We pray also for all refugees, those who are victims of natural disasters, and those in war-torn countries, especially those in Ukraine. We pray, too, for those who are dealing with cancer and its effects on their lives. Give them patience, courage, and hope. And please, Lord, quiet their fear. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for this congregation and all who gather to receive your body and blood this night. We're especially grateful for Peyton Kopchik and Natalie Spreeman and their families as Peyton and Natalie partake of their First Communion this evening. Continue to fill their lives with your forgiveness and joyful presence. Fill all of us at this shared table and nourish us well to heed your example of grace. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We give thanks for those who have died in the faith as we name them in our hearts right now. Teach us by their example and comfort us as we mourn. Renew us by the promise of life together with you. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We offer to you these petitions and those we carry in our hearts, trusting in your abundant and ever-present mercy. Amen. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. Please share the peace of the Lord with one another. You may be seated.
Let us pray. Faithful God, you walk beside us in desert places, and you meet us in our hunger with bread from heaven. Accompany us in this meal that we may pass over from death to life with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, whose suffering and death gave salvation to all. You gather your people around the tree of the cross, transforming death into life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. betrayed our Lord Jesus took the bread gave thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body given for you as often as you partake of this remember me again after supper he took the cup gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, remember me. God of new life, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Raise us up as the body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life into us. Send us out alive with justice, peace, hope, and love. And let us pray together in the words Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Tonight, you are welcome to partake in communion here if you know Jesus as your Savior, and you believe in him. You are welcome here. Uh, when you came, you received a little chalice with grape juice on one side and a bit of bread on the other side. As we share together, I will say the body of Christ given for you. And then you can share in the bread and or say to the person next to you, the body of Christ given for you. And then I'll say the blood of Christ shed for you. And we'll do that again. Um, I'd like to have Peyton. And those coming forward with you, and Natalie, come on forward now. They'll be receiving communion first. And then I will say the words for everyone.
Peyton, the body of Christ given for you. Can eat. Natalie, I'm sorry. I f please forgive me. <laughs> Natalie, the blood of Christ shed for you. Carly, you are a child of God. Jesus loves you and always will. Amen. Jessica, the body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Bobby, if you could. I didn't know you were going to be. <laughs> but if you'll share with the rest of us, then we take. Welcome. <laughs> you may be seated. Peyton, the body of Christ given for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Sherry, the body of Christ given for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. As I share with my husband, Horace, you may share with one another. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. Amen. The body of Christ. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. The ushers will be collecting your plastic cups if you have them.
May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, in a wonderful sacrament, you strengthen us with the saving power of your suffering, death, and resurrection. May the sacrament of your body and blood so work in us that the fruits of your redemption will show forth in the way we live, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we sing um, the next song and prepare for what we call the stripping of the altar, when everything on the altar will be removed for the solemnity of Good Friday tomorrow. After that, you will hear a reading of Psalm 88. Um, it's a psalm about death and dying. I'm taking it this year from the Jewish Bible. So it sounds a little bit different, but it is so powerful. And then when the lights, when we're done stripping the altar, when the psalm is completed, please leave in silence and try to maintain silence until you've left the building. Thank you. Psalm 88. Adonai, God of my salvation, when I cry out to you in the night, 
Let my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry for help. For I am oversupplied with troubles which have brought me to the brink of Sheol. I am counted among those going down to the pit, like a man who is beyond help, left by myself among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave. You no longer remember them. They are cut off from your care. You plunged me into the bottom of the pit, into dark places, into the depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. Your waves crashing over me keep me down. You separated me from my close friends, made me repulsive to them. I'm caged in with no escape. My eyes grow dim from suffering. I call on you, Adonai, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Will you perform wonders for the dead? Can the ghosts of the dead rise up and praise you? Will your grace be declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Will your wonders be known in the dark or your righteousness in the land of oblivion? But I cry out to you, Adonai. My prayer comes before you in the morning. So why, Adonai, do you reject me? Why do you hide your face from me? Since my youth, I've been miserable, close to death. I'm numb from bearing these terrors of yours. Your fierce anger has overwhelmed me. Your terrors have shriveled me up. They surge around me all day like a flood. From all sides, they close in on me. You've made friends and companions shun me. The people I know are hidden from me. Darkness is my only friend. Mm 